Hello, and thank you for joining me tonight on Kingdom Ministries. I really uh, appreciate you coming in and letting me come into your living room or wherever you're at to bring a message tonight that I believe God has given to me for the people. It's a message that, um, that I think we sometimes would uh, prefer we didn't hear, but I believe it has to be spoken. And the title of this message is, Prepare to Meet Your God. I didn't say this, God said it, and so I'm gonna be covering it tonight. We're gonna to begin by, um, in the book of Amos chapter four, and if anybody is turning with me, then that, that's wonderful, Amos chapter four. But you know, I remember when I was a child, my mom and dad were really good about watching over me and loving on me and disciplining me. Now, I got in trouble a lot growing up. I know I don't look like I would get in trouble, but believe me, I got in trouble. And sometimes I got mad at them because I didn't want that discipline. I, I didn't, it wasn't that bad but yet I got in trouble. Why did that happen? My mom loved me. My dad loved me. And because they loved me and they had more wisdom than I did at that young age, they knew that unless they got that trait of mine corrected, I would have trouble the rest of my life. They corrected me because they loved me and yet Back then, at that age, sometimes I would stomp to my bedroom and not be all mad at them because they had disciplined me. I thought they loved me. Don't we do that to God? Don't we blame God sometimes when He's busy disciplining us? Now, why would He discipline us? Because He loves you. He loves me and he does not want that trait that he sees happening right now to become my lifelong issue. So he corrects me and I pray that I say, Lord, here I am, I submit to your correction, but often we do not. Amos chapter four, let's begin reading there. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold the days shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. God is saying, uh, yeah, I'm talking to you, the ones on the mountain up there, those who are being, that are crushing the, the poor. You're the ones I'm talking to right now. You see, God knows where we're at. He said, not only do I see you where you're at on the mountain, I hear and know what's going on in the house. Can't we sometimes put on that Christian clothing and behavior? outside and look different in the house. God will correct us when he knows what's going on in the house as well as in the neighborhood. God said, I am talking to you. And yet so often we say, oh, he's not talking to me. He's talking to her. She's the one he needs to be talking to. Well, I'm doing nothing in comparison to her. Don't we do that? Sure we do, all the time. We judge ourselves against the other one and say, oh, I'm not near as bad as they are. God must be talking to them. I'm sure he is. But in this case, he said, I'm talking to you. And he's talking to me. And it's up to me to listen. It's up to you to listen. Let's begin in verse four. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. 
offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. He says you are picking and choosing the commandments that you want to obey. Don't we do that also? Don't we go and we find one church and we say, oh, no, no, that's not mine. I, I, that's not for me. So we go to another one. Well, no, no. And we keep searching until we find one that it says it's okay to do everything we're doing. And they are out there. We can find a church that says it's okay to act like we want to act. And believe me, those churches are out there. But that's not God's word. In Amos chapter 4, verses 6 through 13, Also I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. You know, whenever we were parents of young children, after they got a little older, we learned that we could take something away to use as correcting to say, okay, you're grounded. That's it. Go to your room. And um, in today's time, we'd say, and hand me your phone. You can't play any more games on your phone. And then they'd pout and they'd go to the room. They wanted that phone back. Jesus said, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. So what in the world does that mean? I didn't give you any food. There wasn't anything to make those teeth get dirty. You see, God says, I took away from you what you would have enjoyed eating and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me. You know, if we take the child's phone away and their games away and they're in their room pouting and they never change their behavior, well, we've got to come up with the next plan. So that's what verse 7 is. I also withheld rain from you when there was still three months to the harvest. They've got a garden going on. They've got plans for this garden. They've worked it. But then suddenly there's no rain. So they're not going to have a harvest. The end of verse 8, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Next step, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased. The locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I went from this stage to this stage to this stage, giving you an opportunity. This whole thing could stop at any point if you just turn back to me. Well, why does he want us to turn back to him? Even in um, verse 11, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, I overthrew whole cities, yet you have not returned to me. You know, sometimes God knows us so well as his children that he knows that when we're in trouble, there's a good chance we'll cry out and say, God, help me. Help me, God. Have you ever made a promise to God in your midst of your trouble? God, if you'll just help me, I'll serve you. Have you ever made that promise? A child sent to his room. His cell phone is in your hand. And he goes to his room and he says, Mama, if you'll just let me out, I'll never do that again. I promise, Mama, but I need my cell phone back. And I say, well, son, I, I hope you're telling me the truth. Oh, I am, Mama. I hand him back his cell phone. But you know what? He went out and did the same thing again. God says, I gave you chance. I gave you chance. I gave you chance. You didn't turn to me. Now, you know what? There's a phrase that I love. It says it's all about him. But he has a phrase that I love too. He says, from his side, it's all about you. He's all about you. You know, I want to be all about my father, but he wants to be all about us. He loves on us. He guards us. He protects us. He watches after us. If I had a friend that had been walking along and they were blindfolded 
and their ears were shut. And they're at the cliff and they're about to walk over and it would be sudden death. Folks, if they were blindfolded and their ears were shut, how could I get word to them if I'm way back here and they've walked away from me over toward this cliff and they're literally running in that direction? How do I stop them? You know, I'm going to look around and if I have to, I'll pick up a stone and I'll go mm, and I'll throw it at them. Stop. And then they may say, why did you throw that rock? And they may think, I don't like them anymore. What was I trying to do? I was trying to save their life. I was trying to stop them before they got to that point. That's what God is trying to do for the people. He sees that we're, we have blinded our own eyes to what's going on. We've covered our own ears to what's going on. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to see it. But yet we're running straight on to the cliff that will lead to certain death. And God says, I'll do whatever it takes. I paid too high a price for you. He sent his son. He said, I'm not letting go of you just because you tell me to go away. Do you think that's going to make God go away? God loves you. And he sees where you're running. If this person, when I throw the rock, they may say, stop it. That hurts. And they keep running. What am I going to do? If I can find a bigger rock, I'm throwing a bigger rock. I'm going to do whatever I can because I love this person that's running in the wrong direction. You see, that's the way God does us. And he says, God sent to them drought in some cities, crop failures and locusts, death and wars overturned cities. He said, yet you didn't turn to me. And we would just say, why is God so mean to me? Remember I said to my parents, I'd say, they don't love me. I'm mad at them. Sometimes we get mad at God because things don't seem to be going our way. But Maybe God is working on us to save us from what he sees ahead. Oh, it doesn't look good right then. It looks miserable. How can this be saving me? Because if all was well, I would probably keep going in the direction I'm going. God will do what it takes to turn us. So how does he love you? With everything he's got. Why would he do it? because he knows that there is a hell and there is a flame and he doesn't want you to go there. He'll do whatever it takes while you are on this side of this earth. He will do what it takes because he loves you that much. Amos chapter 2 verses 10 through 12. Also, it was I who brought you from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel? Says the Lord. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. He says, you diluted their service, the Nazarite service with your own spirit, with your own version of Christianity, with your own version of I'm okay. Why don't you be like me? Doesn't the world want us to be as Christians, to be like them? Sure, it becomes guilt-free. It becomes a, um, uh, we're, all going, we're all going to hell at that point is what we're doing. You see, if they can pull you and deceive you and trick you, they will do it. He said, you have diluted their service with wine. And this was the service of the righteous. This was the service of those who had given their life to Jesus. He said, you've used your spirit. You have to use God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, not man's spirit 
Man, when man begins to mix in with God's spirit, it becomes diluted. Man has to be left out and God's spirit alone. He's a jealous God. He will not share that position in your life. And then he said, and you commanded the prophets not to prophesy. You know what he said? He said, you told them don't speak the word. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Have you ever sought a church that barely even gave the scriptures? Why? Because that's what we want to hear. We want to hear everything but the word, he says. We told the prophets, to, don't say a word. We diluted the righteous, said, come and be like us. Folks, we're to be pulled out of this world. We're not to go into this world. We're traveling through. We don't need to look, act, taste, smell like the world. We need to look, act, taste, smell like Christ Almighty. He gave us an example. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's his command to us. Amos chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Remember, I said, I didn't write this. God did. He said, I gave you drought. I gave you no water, no rain. There was turmoil in your cities, but yet you didn't turn. So I tell you today, do what you need to do to be ready to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Wow. God does not mince words. He doesn't have time for that. It's not in his character. He tells you truth. He only speaks truth and he doesn't try to play with it and make it soft. He tells you like it is. Prepare to meet your God. You know, it's so easy to get sidetracked and letting things that beset us become our everyday routine instead of God becoming our everyday routine. How easy it is to lay aside the Bible and begin to do other things because we're busy. You know, oh, we are busy, folks. I'm not putting that down. I'm, I live in this world too. We're busy. But God wants you to pull aside and be with Him. Trust Him today. Now then, in Amos chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? You see, God says, and He's the lion, He said, I have spoken. I have spoken spoken. There needs to be a, a reverence and a fear of God Almighty. Not like I'm afraid of God, but I respect Him. I trust Him and I bow my life before Him. That's what He wants us to do today. Because if we will, He knows this cliff and He will guide you into paths of righteousness that you've never seen. He says, I make you to lie down in green pastures. I let you drink from still waters, Psalms 23. I let you drink from still waters. There's no thirsting when you're obeying God. It's when we're not obeying Him. Amos reminds me of myself, and so I'm going to tell you a personal story about me. This goes back to December the 2nd, 2016. So for the next few minutes, I want to share with you what God showed me. My church pastor had asked me to pre be prepared to give a, a word from the Lord for direction for the people for 2016. Oh, I had gone through the word and, and I had some really good scriptures picked out. And I thought, well, that, okay. But I had prayed and prayed and prayed and, and God hasn't given me a word so I used his word, which is good. If you have no word, use his word instead of your own. But he awakened me at about three in the morning, December the second, uh, December the second, 2016. 
I said December, it was January, sorry. January the 2nd, 2016. And I knew that I was to give a message. And so I said, Father, isn't there anything that you want me to give? And he gave me two words, two. Roll call, roll call. And I thought, okay, Lord, is there something else you would like to add to that? That's two words, they're good words, Lord, but that's two words. Um, no, he didn't add anything. And I thought, well, let me think about that. I attend a church where there's a lot of elderly. Maybe God is calling many home this year. And, you know, looking back, he did. And I miss every last one of them because I loved them one by one. I loved them and had hugged on them and prayed for them. But God called them home. They had their own roll call. But that January the 2nd, then night after night after night after night, he awakened me around the 3 o'clock hour every day, every morning, and he began to expand on vision after vision after vision. Included in that, he then expanded on roll call. And I began to see a vision of Jesus. I did not see his face, but I did see his arms and his body in my vision. And there was a crowd standing all around us. And we were standing on like a seashore or a sand, a beach. And the Lord stooped down and he picked up a stick. And he took that nice long stick and he drew a big line in the sand. And he stepped over it. I was right there in front of him. And he said, D, what does a teacher do when they first get into class? Well, I'm an old retired school principal. I knew exactly what a teacher was supposed to do. You see, when God wants to talk to you and get your attention, he's going to talk to you in the language you know, that you understand. He's not going to use something you can't figure out. He's trying to talk with you. He said, what's the first thing a teacher does? I said, well, they take role. They see who's with them today. He said, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be taking roll call and seeing who, who would step across, who is on the side of the Lord, who is going to cross over and be with me. I said, oh, Father, let me step over. I want to be with you. And he said, in heaven, there'll be name after name after name, and it'll be those who have stepped over and crossed over and said, I stand on the side of God Almighty. I stand on the side of Jesus. Jesus is my commander. Jesus is my shepherd. I stand with him. I'm willing to cross over. Even if that meant leaving some behind, I'm walking over here, Lord, I'm going to stand on your side. He said, that's roll call. I want to show you in Amos chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it's a royal place, royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, Now this is where I understood him so well because I related so much to this message. He says, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. You know what he said? Look, he said, I wasn't raised to be a prophet, and my father wasn't either. I didn't come through the house of being a prophet, but God told me to come do this. That's the reason I'm here. He said, in fact, I was a sheep breeder. I'm a retired school teacher. I wasn't raised to do this. I was raised to be a school teacher. Remember, take role. And my parents were not pastors. They were not preachers. 
In fact, my dad didn't fully fall in love with the Lord until seven years before he died. I was not raised to be a preacher, or at least I didn't think so. And he says, and so a sheep breeder, you know what I did? I taught Sunday school from the time I was about 16 years old. Sheep breeder. And then he says, I was a tender of sycamore fruit. There I was, a school administrator, my sycamore fruit. I was doing other things, and the Lord called me at age 62 and ordained me. It was a complete change. But it was so much so that I know man didn't send me. Amos says, look, I'm not here because you call me. I'm not here because you asked for me. I'm here because God told me to be here, and I didn't get this by inheritance. I didn't get this because somebody passed it down the line to me. No, I just simply obeyed God. I stand before you in kingdom ministries only because God told me to. God told me to be here. I didn't do it because I got this big theology degree, and I didn't do it because my daddy was a preacher. I did it because my father told me to. And I'm going to be bringing the Word of God to you. Everything He gives me. It's my joy to be here in your presence. It's my pleasure to come and to tell you what God has given me. You know, I'd, I just hope that somewhere along the line, God will feed your spirit. And you'll say, you know what? I'm thirsty. You see, Jesus was the bread. He was also known as the living water. Jesus was the bread, and he's still here. The bread of life is still with us. And the living water, the Holy Spirit, who he sent, that we would never be without a comforter, never be left alone, never wonder what's next, because we know God's in charge. Have you got a situation that you need to turn to Him? Do it tonight, and I'll see you next week. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed Kingdom Ministries with Reverend Dee Levins. For more from Dee, read The Long, Long Night, The Story of Destiny, and Echoes from God, a Christian study book for growing deep and strong in the faith. Connect with Dee and purchase her books at dlevins.com. Send an email to dlevinstv at gmail.com or text D at 254-681-6099.